Hey guys, Roxbox and I here with another how to build your EDH deck video. This video is going to focus on mana curve, which is actually a super important part of your deck. A lot of people don't think about it because, as I said in my last video, most people when they build an EDH deck just gather together a gazillion cards or whatever they have, put it together as fast as they can because they want to play, and they don't really think much about the curve of it until they have trouble. So, we're going to talk about Mana Curve, and I'm going to use as the example, like last time, the Mono Black EDH deck I'm working on. So this is the primer on MTG Salvation. It's not completed yet, which is why it's not a full primer, it's a primer in progress. And I'm going to be continuing to work on it, and I'm going to build off of it. So, let's go to the deck list, and I'll show you what I'm talking about, about Mana Curve. Okay, so... Sorry for the, you know, the uh, film grain. I'm st still trying to find a rec screen recording software for Mac that is doesn't cost money. So I apologize. I'm sorry. The mana curve. Okay. So in any EDH deck, mana curve, ideally, the average mana curve, the average cost of your cards in your deck would probably be somewhere between 2.5 and or maybe 4.5. I'm giving extremes here because once you get to five and over, then your average cost is overcosted. And unless you're playing a really slow multiplayer, the deck probably is going to have some awkward issues. At least early game, you're not going to really have a lot to do. On average, of course. Whereas if you undercost everything, then you're probably unless you're playing tribal. Once again, hands off for all those goblin elf etc tribal lovers out there hands off for you guys i know you that tribal decks tend to run a lot more this is also not including 1v1 competitive decks because oftentimes if you want to ramp up and kill someone very quickly you need to have more cheap drops so i'm talking about if you're playing making a regular edh deck edh commander deck it, it doesn't have to be casual even it can be a it can be a good really good deck but you don't want to you want to make sure that the mana cost falls somewhere between 2.5 and 4.5, I would say. So currently my deck is at 3.68, even though I'm 20 cards over. So that's really, I think it's pretty solid. I, I would prefer, I think in all my decks so far, the average cost is between 3 and 4. That's, I think, I think ideal for the decks that I'm building, which are not themed, not, not necessarily directed at a theme. They're more of just build a good deck, and I'm not really thinking about anything else. Okay, so how does the mana curve actually function when you bring it down to what you're doing with your deck? So, as, a, as I said, this is going to be the average cost of a card in your deck. So, in the early state, so in my deck, the way I usually do things, so the, okay, so the lands on the side here, they're zero cost. So you can obviously play play them out, and they're kind of irrelevant to the broader scheme. Drana sits at 5. So, your general, if you're playing with a cheap general, then most people, their decks, their curve, mana curve takes into account the fact that they're probably going to play their general as soon as they can, because the general is pretty cheap. They don't want to have to think about building up to the general per se. I'm talking a general for cost and less, probably. Those tend to be the more aggro generals, more utility, but either way, they're played earlier. Generals that are 6-7 six to six, seven cost and up are usually, no one thinks about them. And so you have to really, the rest of the cards in the deck have to fill those, have to fill those earlier spots more, more than that, the, the mana cost spot of your general. So if your general is, let's say, 8 mana, then the, that's probably going to be the 8 cost drop, unless you have a problem. Technically, decks use most decks tend to do that. Is they they want to play their general, not necessarily as soon as possible, but to have the option open to play it as soon as possible if need be. Of course, it varies, but <clears throat> at least in the general, in the decks that incorporate their general into them, and the general is not kind of like a sidebar, then they're probably going to want to take that into account. So your curve should be built. Your curve should be built where. Um, you probably have, you have few or zero or, or none zero cost cards, 
zero converted mana cost cards. You tend to have a lot of a lot of a good number of one drops, two drops, three drops, four drops, and then five and up, there tend to be fewer, which is classic curve. You're just extending it as if you were having a 60 card deck that you were just winding, you were adding cards to, the total number. So if you're, if your regular deck, a standard or legacy deck that's 60 cards that would run, let's say, um, you'd run 60, you'd run like 20-ish lands and like 20-ish creatures and in the teens spells, 20 something creatures or and teen spells or flip the spells and creatures and you have more spells and creatures but that's usually kind of the average so EDH is kind of the same thing your lands will probably be between the high 20s and low 40s depending on what you're doing you'll probably have depending on the deck type but you likely will have um, so let's say um, I don't know 30, 30 creatures and 30 spells and 40 land. Let's let's do that as a general archetype. Although, of course, things shift. You might have fewer lands, depends on the colors, yada, yada, yada. But basically, let's pretend it's like that. So, of course, you divide, you want to make sure if you have more spells that fill in the two drop spot, you don't necessarily want to have a lot of creatures in that, in that drop zone. You might want to have, let's say, more creatures in the three drop zone than you would in the two drop zone if you have more spells in the two drop zone. I hope that makes sense. But basically, you wanna make sure there's a balance. If your spells are laid out and you have more spells in X converted mana cost spots, then usually you have fewer creatures in those spots and more in the others. And of course people are like, well, what if there's a good card that's at that's this, this converted mana cost? Or I have a bunch of good cards in this mana cost. And there's all, I also have a bunch of spells in that cost. So you can do that, but it will influence your curve upon what you draw and what you can play. And in this case, let's say I'm going to use my deck quickly, just run, gives you some quick examples. My big cost guys, the average of them is pretty much six, a six drop for the big baddies. So I don't have a lot of spells necessarily that cost six. Here you can kind of see utility spells here. You have two, then you have zero, draw tutor spells that cost six because they have a bunch of six big drops, um, one six planeswalker. And yeah, basically all the six spots, because there are so many creatures in that spot, there aren't as many spells. And similarly, let's say we'll do one and one slash two drops. So you have a you have a bunch of spells that are in zero, one, two drops. These are all pretty much all spells. Um, the one these are spells, and yeah, spells are an art one artifact and more spells, and pretty much no creatures in the one drop. So that's not, that's not a bad thing, because I have more creatures, let's say, I have some creatures, say, in the two drop zone, and yeah, the two drop zone, and I, it's weird because I made my deck where I, I put the creatures under type, not, maybe I should do that, I should separate creatures, spells, and so on, so there's both that deck list and the type deck list, but I, you basically get the idea. So if, you, if you're balancing based on creatures versus spells, then that's the way that's the way I would do it if I was balancing creatures versus spells, because you don't want to flood one converted mana cost area of your deck too much, because if you over flood it with too many creatures, too many spells, then when you get to that drop, or you get to the around that drop, you don't want to be stuck with a whole bunch of things in your hand, no earlier cards to play. That would kind of mess up the entire point of the long-term mana curve. So unlike in, in Standard and Legacy and such, where one, zero, one, two, three drops are super important and you try to have more of those than you do later drops, in EDH it's moved forward a little bit. You kind of want to have more two, well, let's say three, four, five drops, two, three, four, five drops, then zero ones, and you want to have more over the long term. So you want to have, let's say, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are going to have more than just one card in them or two cards in them. You're going to have probably, let's say, 5 to 10 cards in each of those spots, depending on, on what you're playing. So it spreads the curve out and moves things a little bit forward. So mana curve is pretty complicated, um, and I hope I gave an idea. Obviously, tutors and draw spells mitigate a lot of this. They help. 
because if you have a good a good synergy of draw spells with your utility cards, then ideally you would be drawing more options and have fewer problems, but of course you need to make sure that the curve is set. So at the end of the day, no matter what deck you're using, you want to make sure that you have a curve, meaning a curve that you have enough you have enough things enough probabilities of getting cards in each converted mana cost slot that you can continuously play stuff from turn one or two all the way through the end of the game. And you don't want to be drawing too many one drops at the end of the game. You don't want to be drawing too many big ones at the beginning of the game. So this is in EDH. This is very difficult because you only have one of each card, so you can't really balance the probability of your odds per se, like in a standard deck you put four of one card, you have a much higher chance of drawing it versus you put one of one card, you have a much smaller chance. EDH, everything is one. So you have to, you have a big problem that way. But it's very complicated. This is kind of how you have to think about it. You try to make sure that you don't flood one's one converted mana cost slot. You try to move the curve forward. So instead of having the average curve, let's say, be two, unless you're playing tribal, you ideally want to be between three and four. I my personal preference. You could have it a little higher than that, but it's pushing it. And that's kind of the deal on Mana Curve. Obviously, there might be questions because it's a very complicated issue, so feel free to comment below. There are lots of good EDH players out there, and of course, I'm willing to comment back for you guys and hopefully help with any questions. Also, you can always PM me. It's fine. So, thanks for watching, guys. Stay tuned for, for future videos, and Roxbox90 years, signing out. Thanks for watching.